This is the first Hacked Silver Bullets podcast, and we're here with our first guest, Danny Cruz. Hi, Danny. Good thing this is a test run. What's up, Hack? This is called a pilot program. Dogs going crazy in the background. My kid's sitting here doing laundry. Trish is making potato salad, and I'm trying to do a podcast with you. Where are you at, Danny? I'm in the office, man. Why are you working? Uh, my boss, he's a little insane, you know? So even during a pandemic, he's got me coming in the office. That's such BS. That's not true at all. You have a problem. All right, Danny, in all seriousness, we wanted to start this little podcast, and I thought there's no better person to try to dig in and get some details that our fans wouldn't really know about you. So are you ready? What is the craziest place you've ever played in the world? Like craziest atmosphere or just craziest place I've ever been? I mean, like craziest place in the world that soccer has ever taken you. How about that? Egypt. Egypt? Yeah, for sure. What about Egypt was was crazy for you? Um, you know, I think I was 19 at the time, uh, experiencing the culture. I was able to visit the pyramids. I rode a camel, almost killed me. You rode a camel? Oh, yeah. Wow. They are not happy animals, I'll tell you that. If we had a game and you had to come up with an excuse about why you weren't going to ride a camel, what would your excuse be? Why I wasn't going to ride a camel? Right. Uh, probably it's ridiculously high off the ground and one buck and I'm dead. Are you scared of heights? I am when it's a camel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, who are you? Uh, what team were you playing uh, with when you were in Egypt? Uh, the under-20 national team. It was a pre-World Cup camp before we went for the, the real thing. Was that Thomas Rangan, the coach then? He was. Nice. Who's a better coach, me or Thomas? <laughs> you're, you're, you're a better coach. Don't tell Thomas that, though. All right. I'll try not to. And I'm sure he won't listen to this pilot podcast, so we'll never get that out. Um, when you played for me on the under 17 team, you were better at two other sports when you first started playing for me. Tell our fans what those two sports were. I was better at hockey and I was better at football, American football. And what was your position as an American football player? I was a running back. I pretty much played soccer the exact same way. And, <laughs> and how good were you when you were... 14 years old at American football. I was, I was pretty good. I was, I mean, I ended up being uh, all state running back, um, in Arizona. Uh, and at that point I was pretty confident that that's what I wanted to go to college for. Tell me about your hockey career. When did it start? That started when I was five years old. Um, and I played all the way up until, uh, I think I was, I think I was 15 when I stopped, um, and I stopped basically because of where I, you know, I moved to Arizona, um, got into football, which I started to really fall in love with, uh, and then obviously I, I played soccer so that I could stay fit for football at the time. And we have a, a coach in our club that had an influence on you becoming a, a, a soccer player. Who was that coach? Mario Sanchez. And how did he drag you away from, from hockey and football? So football, uh, football is pretty interesting. So I was, uh, I was playing varsity as a sophomore, um, and I played it all the way up through my senior year. And in my senior year, I was playing for a club called Sereno. And uh, it's actually a pretty funny story. I was um, basically going to football practice right after school and then going to soccer practice. And um, Sereno, basically, I was on scholarship at Sereno. Um, my family didn't have a lot of money, um, but as a lot of clubs in the country do, doesn't they try to supplement, help, help you be able to play the sport even if you don't have money. Um, and <laughs> I had a game on Friday night, a football game on Friday night, and it was the game of the week. And uh, at the time, my soccer coaches didn't know that I was playing football. I was just doing both. 
Who are your soccer coaches at Sereno? Les Armstrong and Brian O'Donnell. And uh, long story short, <laughs> I had ended up scoring like, I think two touchdowns that night. Um, and then for some reason, uh, Les had turned on the news and they were showing my touchdowns and that's how he found out. And the next morning I went to go to our soccer game and Les basically told me I had to make a decision. I can't do both. Um, and, uh, and I literally, I, I don't remember how many games, I think I played three games that year, my senior year of high school. Um, and of football, of American football. And, uh, and then, then I literally had, I had to stop playing after three games. So that was really, really tough because I had people relying on me for school, obviously my soccer team. So I ended I basically at that point made a decision that I was going to push forward with soccer and give up my senior year of high school football. All right, let's go back. Cause I know OD better than I know, uh, less. What was, uh, what was Brian's uh, take when he first found out you were playing uh, high school football? Brian was pretty supportive because um, he knew how passionate I was about both. Les, Les was not, not supportive about it at all. But to be fair, I think it was Les pushing me because he saw that, that if I put everything I had into, if I continue to put everything I had into soccer, that there was somewhere to go. Um, so I do believe it was because they all cared. It wasn't you know, it wasn't for any reason other than they cared about me and they thought that it's something that I could have a real future in. So segue back to Mario. Where, how does Mario come into this conversation? I ended up playing for the state ODP team uh, for a guy named John Perlman, um, who's a, who was a mentor of mine when I was younger, just like Mario. Um, a lot of these guys... Uh, were really important to me for my development as a person, um, as a player. My, you know, my, it wasn't the easiest, uh, how do I put it? It wasn't the easiest upbringing. So I had people that I needed to lean on. Um, and they, they were, they were certainly there for that. So Mario identified, well, Perlman identified me, Brian identified me. Perlman ended up being my coach for Arizona ODP. Mario was the regional coach at the time, um, and, I, and I ended up making his regional team. Um, and from there is when he started to recruit me for his college team. You know, you, you talked about your family a little bit, um, not having a lot of money. You know, I know how close your family is to you. Do you mind sharing a little bit about your upbringing? Yeah, my, my dad was in the military, um, you know, most, his, most of my life. Um, and he uh, he was gone quite a bit on uh, at war. Um, he's done a ton of tours. I don't know the exact number. Um, it's probably six or seven. Um, Iraq, Afghanistan. Um, you know, so he was gone quite a bit, um, trying to provide uh, for our family, um, even while being gone. Basically, my all of my soccer coaches played a role in my development as a person and. Uh, and a player. Uh, And Mario was was certainly a major role in that from basically, I think I was 15 or 16 when I when I met Mario. I don't remember the exact age, but it's right around there. If I asked Mario what his first impressions of you were, what do you think Mario would say? First impressions? Yeah. I think his first impression would probably just have been seeing me play. Um, and he probably would say that I was a kid that had a chip on my shoulder um, and that was never going to stop. What about personality wise? <laughs> uh, probably thought I was a little bit crazy. Once we first talked, I think he, he would probably say that I was a humble kid who was driven. Um, probably that I... I don't know. I'm interested. I'm probably interested to hear that, but definitely that I was a, a hardworking, humble kid. Probably. That's a good description. All right. Let's segue back to your, your, your family who I've had the good fortune to, to get to know and um, getting involved in the under 17 team, having some experiences with us as we went uh, towards the world cup in 2007. Um, how did your family play a role 
in your segue from being an American football player and a hockey star into being a, a, a soccer player and a, a player, you know, that at this point is about to go play in an under 17 World Cup in uh, South Korea? Uh, I think my entire family was supportive, but they were more than anything, they were excited for me. You know, I, I without soccer, I wouldn't have traveled anywhere. Like I said, it's not like we had the money to be able to go on vacation, lavish vacations and go where we want to go. Um, so they were excited for me more than anything. At the time I was living in my grandmother's house, she was um, really someone that was important to to my success. I mean, without her, I have no roof over my head. Um, you know, so she was, she was a massive part of my life, my upbringing. All of them, including her at the time, were just excited for me, you know, and they knew that I had put a lot of time and effort and energy into it. I mean, sports was my life. It's, it was my getaway. All of them were excited to hear about my experiences. I mean, none of them had been to Egypt, you know, uh, none of them had been to Korea. Um, so if, more than anything, they were just wanting to hear about the experiences and how it went. Do you remember um, any crazy stories when you were playing on the under-17 team? Oh, man. The biggest thing I, I remember from that was – uh, our pre-training camp in Clemson. Um, I pretty much felt like I was going to die the entire camp. So, but at the same time, you're like, you have to give everything that you have or else you're not going to make the roster. So it was pretty, I just remember how hot and brutal that was. I remember chasing after uh, different players that you were trying to, to beat out on the roster. Um, all those things. Maybe it was Atlanta, actually. Sorry. Clemson was tough, too, but I think we did that in Atlanta, too. I think we went from Atlanta to Clemson. Um, all right, there, is there, are there any stories? Take me as a coach off the field, but is there anything I did at that point um, that you or your teammates thought was uh, interesting or funny, or is there any stories? Yeah, it was, bull, it was bullshit. You would, you would do fitness with us and beat half the team. You know how demoralizing that is as a player? What are you talking about? What are you talking about specifically? What do, you, what do you mean, what am I talking about? You would run fitness with us and beat half of the players. And all the players are like, oh, well, I can't even beat the coach. I'm definitely not going to make the team. It's ridiculous. Well, I definitely beat you a lot. And you yeah. made the team. So. Yeah, because you kept, you kept making us do the Cooper. That's not my forte. The beat test, no problem. But the Cooper is ridiculous. Run two miles as fast as you can, five-minute break, and then – Run another mile in six minutes? Are you kidding me? You enjoyed that time? Oh, my God. I hated that test. Every time I heard you say the Cooper, I about threw up before we started. I want to go back to, were you on the trip to South Korea before we went to the World Cup? I, I think so. I think I went twice. Yeah. And do you remember we were playing New Zealand and it was not going so good? So do you remember that halftime talk at all? Was that when you threw the water cooler? That's correct. Uh, yeah, I do remember that. Can you tell our Lucy fans about that halftime speech? All I remember hearing was that we weren't we weren't playing very well, and and you you came in, you didn't say much, then you just exploded. You started throwing. You threw, you threw the water cooler. I think you threw water bottles too. And it was pretty much a wake up, a wake up call for the entire group. You probably remember it to the T. No, I just remember guys telling me about about it, and I know I definitely threw a Gatorade cooler, maybe two. And our, our trainer at the time, um, Paul Rushing Polly, uh, has never let me forgot the whole story. And, and where I kind of probably blanked out a little bit, um, he he goes into detail. So. I love it. I love it. Good. All right. Well, let's segue a little bit. You you ended up playing for Mario uh, at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, um, and you alluded to the fact that he he recruited you there. Um, how was that time playing at UNLV for him? Oh, it was amazing. Um, honestly, I loved every minute of it. I had a lot of learning experiences as well. Um, for sure, there were times where. Um, I think I let my head get a little bit too big. Um, there was a couple really good learning moments um, from him uh, for me that I think really helped uh, as a person 
and a player. Um, but it, I loved UNLV. Loved everything about it. Tell, tell me a story about Mario um, that nobody would probably know about, or he had to deal with you in a certain way. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. He, he'll tell this story much better than him than me because his mind, his memory is much better than mine. But <laughs> basically, we were doing really well in our conference. Really well, like better than anybody thought we were. Um, so much that we were competing for the first time in a really long time to probably win the conference. <clears throat> and it was the week leading up to our biggest opponent, the other best team in the conference at the time. Who was that? New Mexico. And uh, I got into I was a pretty feisty player, and I got into it with one of our, our players. And, uh, and Mario had me go on the line and do fitness in front of the group. And I basically took the piss out of it. I, I, I was like jogging when I was supposed to be sprinting and, and him and I got into a big verbal altercation in front of the group and he kicked me out of training. And uh, I basically went into the locker room, cleaned out my locker, left my stipend check on my, on my, uh, on my um, uh, uh, chair and, uh, and I told him I quit. You know, and I, I, I left, went back to my dorm, you know, and long story short, it was a, you know, I went to him, apologized for my actions and he had to make a, a pretty, a really tough decision. Um, and he suspended me uh, before that biggest game of the year. Like this game was so important that it could make or break us winning the conference. And uh, it was on the road in New Mexico but I was a kid that once I thought about the things that I was doing and, and had time to reflect, it was, you know, gosh, I'm, I'm a fucking idiot, you know? And uh, so he suspends me. We, we meet. I apologize. He tells me it's unacceptable, not only as a player, but as a person, the way I spoke to him. And he uh, he's ends up suspending me for the game uh, and said, you know, I have to make a statement and this isn't okay. And so I end up driving, spending my own money, which I didn't have a lot of to go to the, to, to drive to New Mexico to support the team. Good um, question. Do you ever cash that check, that stipend check? I think he gave it back to me. I, I mean, I'm sure I needed it for sure. I needed it. Um, All right. He, so you drive from Las Vegas to yeah. Albuquerque. How long a drive was that? Oh, I don't, I don't remember. It was a while though. Maybe were you, were you by that? yourself? No, I went with a couple other guys that weren't dressing. We split gas and did that whole thing. Um, and they lost. Quick question. Did you have any beers either to John. or from Albuquerque? <laughs> no, not, not no. one. Ruth, Danny. I swear. I swear. Not one. All right. Not one. All All right. Did, 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 did your team win or did they lose? They lost. They lost the game. They played really well. That was what even better. I, I remember thinking I wish they would have just got slaughtered because then I wouldn't have been feeling as bad. But it was so close. You're sitting there thinking, like, God, I'm a dumbass. You know, like. But I understood why he suspended me. Anyway, I think it says more about Mario than it does about myself. That as a coach in a moment like that where he would say to you, I was probably one of the more important players on the team. Um that he decided to suspend me, despite the fact that it might not have been best for the group, in the sh for the result, I should say, not for the group, for the result. I, I love that about Mario, that he actually has some ethics that puts yeah. his personal development over results sometimes. So, yeah, a hard thing for a coach to do. No doubt. Yeah. You had a teammate at UNLV that you're really close to and ended up being a really good player, still is. Uh, tell us about him. Nick DeLeon? Correct. Yeah, he was, uh, he was in my wedding. Um, ended up being a really, really, you know, him and I are very close. Um, he, uh, we stayed in contact even when I went into the league. Um, tried to help give him advice on what it was like and, Ironically, got I got traded to the team 
that he got drafted to, um, which I think was was really, really positive for both of us. I had been in the league for three years at this point, and I got traded to D.C. United. Nick got drafted there, and I think it was, for me, I had a ton of experience at that point, and I think it was good for him to come into a group where with somebody that he cares about, that knows cares about him, you know, helps give him any feedback that he can for, for his success. And so let's go back a little bit in time. How many, how many years did you play at UNLV? One and a half. Played for, for two seasons. And then how did you make the decision to go pro? I did it with Mario, actually. I had a, a ton of agents around the, the national team, you know, telling me to leave. Um, that there's going to be a good offer on the table. But the only guy at that point that I really trusted for my well-being was Mario. So I sat down. I remember I was in his office, said this is the contract. Uh, I signed with an agent that I know that I started to believe cared about me not only as a soccer player but as a person, and I still believe that to this day. I've been with him for a very long time. All right. Tell us Gart's name, full name. Mike, Mike Gartland. Um, do I know Mike? You know Mike Garland. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's, I guess what I would say about Mike is if I didn't have him in my corner, I don't think I would have been mentally been able to get through everything that I got through to have as long of a career as I had, for sure. Um, which I think, unfortunately, you know, even deal, there's not a ton of agents like that out there. Um, and that's what I loved about him, or still do. So I went into office with Mario. This was the offer. Asked for I'm so sick of dealing with Gartland over <laughs> contracts for you. I mean, now I have to deal with him as you being the technical director here at Loose City. Like this and is. I have to deal with him too. I have to deal with him too. I mean, what a pain in my ass when I was in Philly, and now like, when am I going to not have to negotiate with Gartland about you? <laughs> Hopefully not for a long time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Anyway, let, we, we're digressing. Go back to uh, go back to your your deciding to go pro. Yeah, I, I had the contract with me. Um, I sat down with Mario and we went over every detail of it. Obviously, I did it with my agent as well, but I wanted Mario's feedback. He had built a pretty phenomenal. Pro, he, he had built a pretty phenomenal program at UNLV. So I had that emotional attachment too, where I was like, I really think we're going to be good next year. You had, you had a lot of guys that actually have had success in MLS that came out of there, out of UNLV, a small school from a soccer standpoint, Lamar Nagel, Nick DeLeon, you had myself, a guy named Nicky Patterson. Um, there was a lot of, of talented players. <coughs> um, and I, and so I had that emotional attachment too. Like I'm leaving guys that I care about, um, including a manager, uh, to go pro. But Mario wanted what's best for me as well, and and he told me uh, there he doesn't see any negative to to taking the contract that was presented to me. You know, um, and I made the decision at that point to to sign the deal with MLS. And so you go to you go to Houston. How did, um, you get drafted by Houston um, or picked up by Houston? How did that that work out? I got drafted. Got I had drafted. a nightmare of a combine. I dropped really really late, and I ended up at the best place I could have ended up for my career. All right. So tell me the best thing that happened to you in Houston. <laughs> Like a funny story or from a from a no, no, just tell me off the top of your head the best thing that happened to you in Houston. I was able to play with a successful group of older players that uh, do, you, do you know how bad you're you're gonna get in trouble when you go home and your wife hears this? <laughs> you didn't you didn't preface it that way. I you said the preface- best thing that happened to you in Houston and you I start thought- listening. Talking Listen. soccer, and then you switched over to uh, you, you didn't. This is so, this is about you, Dan. This is your life. What was the best thing that happened to you? I met my wife. Aww. Yay! Aww. We're yeah. My wife and I are way bigger fans of Brittany than we are of you. By the That's way. That's not true. I love you both. 
Yeah, it's kind of true. That's okay. I love you both. <laughs> All right, so edit that out. What um aside from the fact that you met the love of your life in Houston, um best thing about being there as a player? Yeah, I, I would say the best thing was the experience of the players that I went to to sorry, that were on the team, the way that they kept me humble but still believed in me, even though I was a little bit behind. Well, I was much behind a lot of them. Um, but they, they pretty much looked at me as a little brother, I feel like. Um, and I still talk to all of them, not all of them, to a lot of them um, to this day. Um, we had some amazing experience. And then I had a manager who saw me for what I was, Tom Kinnear, um, and a manager that believed in me. You know, I think if you don't have that, I, if I didn't have that, I, I didn't have as long a career as, uh, as I did. So let's stay with Houston. And you and I were talking about this on our first uh, away game this year, the only game we played um, while we were going to North Carolina. And you were referencing the situation of where you sat on the plane when you were at Houston and how some of the older players um, would have dealt with you in reference to some of our young players. Can you explain a little bit about that, please? Yeah. Uh, one time I, I had a first class ticket. It was one of my early trips traveling. Um, and the older guys saw that I had it. And there was no conversation. They walked up, they took my ticket, they gave <laughs> me their ticket, and I was in a middle seat. Went from first class to middle seat. But that was like, for me, I had no problem. Like, I put my head down. I think that's what they respected about me. But, like, I'll give you an example. I could not, if treatment started at 8 o'clock in the morning, I could not get treatment if I didn't get there at 6.30, 7 o'clock. Because if, if those players walked in and saw me on the table, oh, forget it. My day was ruined. I was done. I mean, I was getting absolutely slaughtered by everybody. I don't see that much anymore. And do you think that's how it should be currently? Like, do you think that was a good culture to come up in as a young player? A hundred percent. One thousand percent. I loved everything about it. When I look back, I look at why that team was so successful. Dom and that culture was, was unbelievable. And so if you could give Jonathan or Elijah or Moo like a, a, a little bit of advice as a young player um, now that you're coaching them and you're now the mentor, what would it be? Take, listen to everything that everybody's talk, telling you. Like keep an open mind. Don't let, your, don't let your own feelings or your own beliefs detract from what people are trying to tell you because they're trying to tell you it for a reason. And when I was younger, I had that mentality. I had that. I didn't always agree. I didn't always, but I, I heard it. I listened to it. And, uh, and that was, for me, was key, I think, to my success. Do you remember which player took your uh, first class seat? Yeah. Yeah, he's the technical director at the Columbus crew now, Pat Onstead. <laughs> I love it. Which, by the way, I was 19. He was like, I don't even know, 40? Something like that. He, yeah, well, that's a different story. How about Brian Ching? Was he involved in this conversation at all about whether he was sitting in first class or not? No, because he was in first class no matter what. He's already there? Yeah. yeah. Was Stu, was Stu not, in the conversation? Not at that time. Not at that time. He was still a young buck like you yeah. trying to fight for. Okay. Yeah. We're talking about Stu Holden, uh, <laughs> Brian Ching, two guys that I had to. The pleasure of coach on the national team and um coincidentally they sat first class all the time and i sat back in the middle row when we were flying around the world um really just give a reference all right although shout out to pam perkins because she would find a way to, to push me up there sometimes so uh, anyway it. um a name we just threw out there and i wasn't planning to, do you did you ever have any experience with pam perkins at all oh yeah she was awesome. Like we're bringing up a, a team administrator or the, you know, the operations person with soccer team. Tell me the, the best team 
administrator you've ever been around in the game. <laughs> You're going to get me. It's going to be anarchy. It's going to be absolute anarchy. I've had a ton of team admins. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, who's number one? His name's Tamor Rushdi. Wow, I've not heard that name. Where is he from and what, what team were you on? Uh, he, I was uh, on the Real Monarchs. He's currently the club secretary for a team in England now, Barnsley. And he's a guy that what I love about him is he's always has a smile on his face, always. And that's really important in... In his opinion, that's really important in what he does because it's contagious. Um, no matter what challenge was thrown at him or whether he was mad at something, you would never, ever know. You wouldn't. Super professional, um, very quick to get things done. And he actually worked his way up the ladder. Like, he was he – a great story just came out actually online from Barnsley, and I read through it, and it's just – it's a Q&A with him. He started at UW picking up cones – then he went from there with Jamie Clark and Craig Weibel. Then he went from there to uh, being the kit guy, really. Then he went from there to being a team admin. Then he went to the mono. It's just. All right. Great. This, this podcast is not about him. All right. So let's just segue. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Next question. Who was the best trainer you've ever had? <laughs> oh, man. Paul Rushing. Definitely. That's Definitely. not true. Yeah, because you want to know why banter was just as important as as uh, as the actual treatment. All right, where did you have Paul Rush in as a trainer? Philadelphia Union. He the trainer with the 17s as well? Yeah, I had him with the 17s as well. All right. Um, best kit man you've ever worked with? Oh, man. And if you say Ben Holzman, we're done. No, uh, I won't say Ben Holzman. Holzman's got potential, though, right? Yeah, yeah. He's, where he's Listen, he's going like this, as he would say. You know, he's flying. He's flying. Um, probably – I've had a ton, man. Um, his name's Randy at Salt Lake. Randy – you know the last name? I'm honestly forgetting his last name. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even remember the dude's last name. Yeah, but listen, he's awesome. He's a legend. Yeah? Yeah. So any, any other kit mans you've had that have been legends? Oh, man. Oh, my God. JP. JP. JP goes by another name. What's I his other to, name? I used to go into massive wrestling matches with JP and Paul Rushing. Yeah, what is that called? Thun a, a Thunderdome. The whole 17 team would beat the living shit out of the both of them. JP's like five foot one. He'll tell you he's five four. He's not. And and a Thunderdome would ensue in the middle of the training room. And the players always beat the shit out of JP and Polly. Pretty much. I can remember getting in on one of those. We were on a trip in Germany. And I think I got you really good with a pile driver to the back of your neck. <laughs> Oh my god. I don't I don't remember. Honestly, I probably got a concussion when that happened. Do you remember my nickname for JP? No, what was it? Money. Oh yeah. Or Jay Pizzle. Yeah, he he had a lot of nicknames, but yeah. that cat was money for me. He would do anything. So yeah, um, still cool. is. Legend. I love it. All right. So on a personal note, let's go back to Houston for a second. Um, you met your now wife, mother of your first child. Tell us about Brittany. Oh, man. And you're most, not allowed to cry. Most caring human being I know. Um, for people that are in this business, they know that you have to have a strong um, woman who understands the lifestyle, meaning hours, um, travel, to be able to – and. and and I've been traded numerous times, and I don't think people understand how difficult that is for the spouse, where you're on a flight the next day, she's packing, she's putting the, the moving stuff together. Um, she's a strong woman who's loyal, 
trustworthy. Um, I'm, I'm pretty lucky. And she's beautiful, which I don't know how you, you pulled that off, but yeah, yeah, she's beautiful. Definitely a 10 out of 10. Absolutely. Tell me how many places you drag Brittany to around the country, actually around the world. Let's see. DC, Philadelphia, Minnesota, California, Norway, Salt Lake City, Google, at least seven. So when 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 I was able to get you to come to Louisville, you were at Salt Lake, right? Yep. yep. Brittany was there working and things, and you had come to Salt Lake from San Francisco. Is that correct? Correct. Right, but tell me where you and Brittany had to go rent a U-Haul to go pick up your stuff and move it here to Louisville. Where we had to get it from? Yep. <laughs> we, uh, we, I can't remember if we flew to Minnesota and we landed and then rented a U-Haul. We rented a U-Haul for sure in Minnesota. Right, and, so and just give our fans, remember, like, you had to... This is where you were getting your stuff from to come to Louisville, but you'd already been in Salt Lake and San Francisco. Correct. How long did your stuff sit in, in Minneapolis for? Uh, uh, almost a full year. All right, which brings up another interesting little you know tidbit that people probably don't know about you, uh, is that you tend to leave stuff around the world or around our office or around places you visited do you do you think you have a problem with leaving stuff in random places you've been in the world no honestly i think it's it's uh sometimes i have too much shit so i have to leave it it's a choice is it like a little trail of crumbs for for the people that you're connected with to find stuff from you it's not a good quality. That's for sure. That's for sure. People who know you, it, it's endearing because now we had a, a lot of your shit and we collect it as we go. And I personally have a lot of it because I had to pick up a lot of your shit around the world. And even today, I still have to do that. So thank you for that, Danny. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, no problem. It's just a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> All right. What's the... You, you and Brittany recently uh, welcomed your first child in the world. Tell us how life is as a dad. Oh, man. I don't sleep, uh, but the kid is healthy. He's smiling. He's happy, and that's all that matters. He won't sleep, though. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, you would think that, like, if I'm getting tired and Brittany's getting tired, like, he's still a human being. He's going to get tired. He doesn't get tired. It's ridiculous. On one hand, I like it because he's active and I know he's going to be active. On the other hand, it's a nightmare. We're doing shifts like 8 p.m. to 3 a.m. and then 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. It's crazy. But I love this kid. He's kind of like you. He has a lot of energy. A lot of energy. No doubt about it. Definitely get it from his dad. And what is he, like four months old and you have him walking already? <laughs> he's almost three months and he's going to be – listen, I expect him – to be potty trained, walking, and eating solid foods in the next month, or else we got a problem. <laughs> All right. I, I think you're, wow. What do you expect to happen first? That, that Santi walks, or we're back training with uh, Lou City? He will be walking before we're back training. And that's just the expectation that we're back training in June. So, fair. Totally fair. All right. Um, is he going to have bigger calves than you have? What do you think? No, I'm actually disappointed in the way they look right now. I got to be honest. He's got the whole same ab thing as me where there's just one. It's just one ab. You know, it's kind of – he's going to be thick. Um, but he's, I don't know if he's going to have my calves. I hope he does. <laughs> I hope um, he does. I hope he has your calves too, Danny. How about how driven are you – to put more trophies in that trophy case for, for our Lou City fans. That's all I think about. I mean, I'm, I'm driven by winning. I'm outside, driven. Of your, outside of Brittany and Santiago, it's then winning trophies. Is that the correct order? 
Oh, a thousand percent. And that's not even an exaggeration. If I asked Brittany this same question, where do you think she would put those those three? Uh, she would go trophies, my job, Santi, then her. How she puts up with you is unbelievable. I mean, we're in quarantine. She's working from home, and I left her to come here so I could get some shit done for you. Okay? Unbelievable. That's, that's my... Listen, I love what we do. I love what we do. If anything, this quarantine has made me realize how much more I love what we do. It's crazy. That's pretty awesome. All right. Tell us what you're currently working on. Uh, right now, I'm working on a scout for every team uh, that played. Like right now, what team are you working on? Indy 11 right now. I'm pretty much finished up with Indy 11, and then I'm on to Miami. When am I going to get that ND11 scout, Danny? You'll have it today, actually, if you want it. Good. Do you know who our next opponent is? No, do you? Nope. <laughs> That's why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. I want you to focus on our next opponent, all right? I don't know who that is. So I'm focused on every single team that played in week one in the East. How they play, style of play, video, everything. Here's what I want. I want a Pittsburgh scout now. Okay. Wait, how much? They didn't play in week one. Right. So I don't care. Just get it done. All right? Okay. Deal. I'll sort it out. I'll find the video. They played like seven colleges in preseason. I'll find them. They played uh, Pitt. So we'll ask uh, Vidovich and uh, put Vidovich on tape on them. We have to. Although they played a couple different systems already. So we'll put it together. We you always about that La I, I lied I want one more one more little tidbit about you and, and coaching you've become this kind of wonder kid coach on set pieces how did that happen one goal in Indy against Indy but to be honest I haven't been very happy with it so I, I still have a lot to walk us through that one goal against Indy who scored it number one Kyle McCabe Talk us through that that and how it all evolved. I spent many hours scouting every set piece that I could that they had done defensively. Um, I drew up a play that I thought how they would react to it based off the information that I collected. And uh, Indy set up exactly the way I thought they would set up. Uh, and they reacted to each for lack of a better word, for each chess piece we moved, they reacted exactly the way that I anticipated they'd react. And Niall did the rest with a nice finish from the top of the box. So how upset are you that he went and hugged Holzman before coming to hug you? <laughs> Not at all. I'll tell you this. That was one of the best feelings I, I had experienced as a coach so far in my career at that, at that point, at that point. Because you feel the culmination of something, of all the work and the hours that you put in. Like, you're talking about five hours of analyzing set pieces for 15 seconds of, of a, that, for a play that takes 15 seconds at the moment. Like, it was a pretty big culmination. That's and cool. I'm happy for Holzman, man. That kid, that kid, he needs it. He needs that. Give him hugs. He you know? does. He does. All right, I'm going to close this first ever podcast with a story um, about you doing something similar for me. So um, I was in the hot seat at Philly, and we're playing at uh, Sporting Kansas City, and you end up scoring uh, the first goal. I think it ended up being the winning goal, right? I think so. Well, it, the, the crazy part to that story is I had no idea – but you guys, the players, had talked about what you were going to do, whoever scored that first goal in that game. We ended up beating Sporting Kansas City. Um, I got fired a couple weeks later anyway. But my point of the whole thing was I was so appreciative of what you and the rest of your teammates did. And, you know, sometimes those little memories, like Niall scoring that goal, um, it's not about the wins and losses. It's about these little moments that are so important to all of us because of what we put into it. So just want to say thanks to you um, for providing me with one of those personal moments. I'm with you, brother. All right, Danny. Thanks. 
Um, hope you enjoyed our time together, and um, we'll see how my wife is at editing this and see if we put out something that our fans can enjoy. Is this one going out, or are we going to redo this? This is a pilot program, so we're doing this. This is it. Oh, shit. All right. Good luck editing. All right. Thanks, Danny. Later.